Hi everyone, welcome to the Scanzi House. I am Rachel Easton. I am the Education Director for Harbor Wild Watch. And we are gonna take a quick little tour uh, of a couple of my favorite spots on the Harbor Wild Watch office. The first is the creatures. So we'll come back to my fishy friends here in a moment. Um, but I wanna quickly point out this guy right here. This is our live webcam. So this is available on our website 24-7. Um, we never really know what we're gonna see on this. We've seen really big things like crabs and harbor seals. Sometimes we see fish. You really never know what you're gonna get. So every time I'm in the office, even if the um, exhibits are closed, I pop on that screen just so I have an idea of what's happening out there. So if during the course of our presentation you see me like, oh, it might be because something cool is on the screen. And so we're gonna, we'll be talking about uh, the fish tanks a little bit in here. And I'm gonna flip my camera around here so that I can show you some of my good friends in here. Now I apologize for that glare. I'm gonna try to block it with my head. So it might get a little bit awkward. But I have pulled a couple of the crustaceans out of our touch tanks so that you can learn a little bit more about them. And to help me learn a little bit about you, if you wouldn't mind popping into the comment section and maybe put your age and your location that you're watching from, even if you're watching this after the fact, um, that really is helpful for us to know how far of a reach we've got. And then of course, we would appreciate any shares that you want to um, contribute to. So please, please share this video with your friends. We'd love to uh, kind of showcase our cool creatures when nobody really gets to visit them right now. So um, I'm gonna come down here and point out uh, a couple of my friends here. Now we've had these animals in this tank uh, for a number of months, so I've gotten to know them fairly well. So what we're looking at are mostly crustaceans, um, and although I see a couple of mollusks have snuck in here too. Um, I've got a couple of crabs. So the first crab that I'm gonna talk, actually I've got three crabs right here on the screen. Oh, how perfect is that? So I've got three crabs here um, that I'm gonna talk about, and then I'll talk about a, a close crab relative. So the first um, is this really nice, kind of purpley, pinky colored animal. That is a graceful crab. And they get confused with juvenile Dungeness crabs, the edible crabs that we have here in Washington quite frequently, because they're that same general shape. They're also similarly colored, um, but there are two ways that you can tell a graceful crab apart from a uh, Dungeness crab, and that is to look on their carapace. There is the widest notch here, and then just behind it, there's one extra little divot. Um, that is how you can identify a graceful crab. Also, on the pincher right here, can you see that little white dot? A Dungeness crab would have a row, almost like a comb of those little, um, peaks on their on their arm um, and the graceful crab only really has that one and then there's just the size so legal size for um, harvest in Washington is six and a quarter inches and graceful crabs top out at about six inches so they never really get to be that full size that we would uh, expect to find in a in a graceful crab or excuse me in a Dungeness crab so this graceful crab is uh, sort of an opportunist in terms of what it's able to eat. So it'll eat um, any different types of food. It'll eat kelp, dead stuff. In our tanks, uh, they really like squid and they really prefer to have um, like mysis shrimp, which is uh, kind of like brine shrimp. It's a small uh, little crustacean that's harvested in big numbers and then frozen uh, for people to be able to feed off. Um, okay, so that's our graceful crab, there's one. And then, We'll go look over here to this red crab. This one, you might call it a spider crab if you were to see it on a dock or at the beach because it's got sort of a narrow body, especially compared to our more traditionally shaped crab here. But this is a northern kelp crab and they are really um, the herbivores of the crab world, although they're not above scavenging as well. And we'll see a little bit of how our crabs, yeah, they're crabby. Um, they get a little territorial in our tanks um, and most of them kind of have their own little space, but I've of course pulled them into this small little tank so that I can show them off. So this Northern kelp crab is really kind of unique because the arms are very, very long. The pinchers are able to uh, reach behind them. So this is a crab you wanna be really 
definitely very careful about uh, handling because they can reach where other crabs can't. Normally I would say, oh yeah, it's totally safe to pet a crab like gently on their back. Um, but with the kelp crab, they can reach their back. So it's not always a great idea, um, especially when their pinchers are more designed for cutting than they are for crushing. So they have very, very sharp pinchers. And that's so they can cut through the kelp and be able to um, eat that. And then there's another crab in here and you may not have noticed because it's quite well camouflaged. Um, this is what we call a sharp-nosed decorator crab. I'm gonna pull it out so you can see a little bit. This is a really, really cool crab species. Um, definitely trying not to look like a crab. Um, and they have this really pointed rostrum. You can see that, that's the nose. Very small, oh, very small eyes. Trying not to be pinched here while still showing off this really cool creature. Um, really neat, very bumpy carapace. And then they're coated with lots of teeny tiny hooks that are almost like Velcro. And so what, um, what they'll do is they'll use their pinchers to cut off a piece of algae or maybe sponge or some bryzoans or tunicates and they'll place them on their shell. Now this one has recently molted um, which means this crab has shed its its outer coating, um, its outer armor, and is able to um, begin decorating once again. And then in this tank, the other kind of main big creature that we see moving around in here are hermit crabs. And we've got um, several of them in this tank. They're definitely a crowd favorite. And hermit crabs are not true crabs. They have one less set of walking legs. So where our kelp crab has uh, four walking legs and then their pinchers the making it for like a total of ten these guys only have a total of eight um, and they also have really long antenna so the antenna on this one is nice and orange and so you can kind of see and the antenna can reach to the sides of their shell um, which is really helpful because if you're carrying around a big shell for protection you're not probably able to turn and look behind you um, to see if anybody's coming. Um, so here's another one. And these hermit crabs, they do not make these shells, they have to take them. So they have to take them from uh, the animals that make the shells or from another hermit crab that's, um, you know, needs to upgrade. So when they find a shell that, that fits them, um, they will either kill the snail and uh, eat it and then take their shell or sometimes they'll fight with other hermit crabs um, And I'm gonna see if I can pull this guy out a little bit um, If I roll him over he's gonna think that he's stuck and he's gonna try to reach and grab a hold so that we can um, See those they're kind of their back half of their abdomen here. There we go. So he's grabbing onto my finger, which ooh, tickles quite a bit. Um, luckily for me, my finger is a little bit too thick for those pinchers um, to really grab a hold. But now you can see the back half of their abdomen. See those tiny little, like almost miniature legs on the side there? True crabs don't have those. So this is really, really cool to see how stretched and how skinny that abdomen is. And that is totally soft back there. It's almost like a worm. Um, on the back half. And that's so that they can wrap it into the, the snail's shell and be able to kind of hold it. And then they're really strong. So this is a pretty hefty shell. And as soon as I let go of it, that hermit crab was able to flip itself over. Um, the other thing I will point out on our hermit crab friend here, before we transition and start talking about um, some skulls, is that the right claw is noticeably bigger than the left claw. And that has to do with the way the direction that the snail's shell spirals, and that is so that this hermit crab can use its big pincher as a, uh, almost like a trap door, as a way to kind of seal um, what's going on in there. Now, when, anytime I put the hermit crabs back, I have to kind of burp them um, and get the, the air out of their shell. Now, they can do that too, uh, but I figure I might as well be nice. Um, speaking of nice, this is a very, very lucky hermit crab we have. Um, she is missing her pinchers and a couple of legs. And though she can regrow those as she molts, um, it's a slow process. And so she's really lucky she lives with us where she gets fed all the time. Um, yeah. 
Okay, you guys say you're freezing cold. This water temperature is about 50 degrees right here, um, which is very, very, very cold for my nice warm mammal hands. Um, but I'm glad the, at least it's a nice, nice sunny day outside. <laughs> All right, so that's a little bit about my, my hermit crab friends. Hopefully I'll be able to post um, some more about them later, especially if that's something that you guys like. We love to see the questions that you have, so keep those coming in the, um, in the comments. Oh, I'm so glad, Sherry, that you and your kids are watching. This is awesome. It's so fun to see where everybody's from and how you found out about Harbor Wild Watch. Well, um, while you're enjoying the show, you can um, think of maybe some kind words that you could drop into our uh, review section. Facebook has almost like a Yelp style review for pages and we would love it if you've got some positive and kind words to say about us. Um, that would be awesome. Okay, so now I promised you that I would talk about skulls because that's the real reason I came here today but I figured oh, I can't be in the office with my friends the crabs without um, giving them a little spotlight. I'm gonna pop my phone here into tripod. All right, can you see me? All right, there we go. Okay, so we're gonna transition away from our sea creature friends and focus on another part of the Harbor World Watch exhibit space, and that is our skull collection. Now we have a really extensive uh, collection of skulls and they come from a variety of places. One, I've been a naturalist for a long time and when people come across dead stuff, they give it to me. So I have lots of skulls that are donated um, from friends of mine who stumbled upon something cool out in the woods, um, which is always really fun. So if you're out there and you've got something dead, uh, shoot me a picture of it <laughs> if you want to give it to us. We love, we love dead stuff. Uh, I know Stina, my coworker, and I are kind of always getting in trouble a little bit when our boss walks into our office and there's something stinky sitting in a cup. Um, but hey, what are you gonna do? It's who we are. Okay, so one, people give me weird stuff. Two, we've had some more formal donations from uh, individuals in our community. So uh, Dr. Paul Kadzik, who is a, a retired dentist who lives just a couple of uh, blocks down from us, donated his entire educational collection which is really, really cool. We got some amazing skulls from him and we're super grateful to be able to display those. And then because we are an educational facility, we also have the ability to have skulls on loan to us from NOAA. So um, some of our more priceless skulls and our largest skull have come from NOAA. Um, and we have to maintain paperwork that says we're legally allowed to have those things. So. Um, I've got a bunch of documentation if anybody's interested in seeing it. But here is our skull collection. There's like, gosh, I don't even know how many we're up to, um, but there's probably easily 40 skulls right here. And what I'm gonna do is teach you at home how to read a skull. Now, don't worry, if you don't have a skull handy, you have a skull handy. You've got a built-in skull here. Um, and I'm gonna bring my friend Alfonso here out. I like to tell people that Alfonso is a seventh grader who's not a, who who didn't listen during one of our lectures, which of course is not true. I got Alfonso on Amazon. Uh, he was he's a, a teaching model. I think he was twenty bucks. Um, if speaking of Amazon, if you're shopping on Amazon while you're stuck at home, um, if you use smile.amazon.com and um, that allows you to nominate a charity of your choice and a percentage of all sales will go to that charity. So you can nominate Harbor Wild Watch. We are a 501c3 organization, and we would love it if you would support us doing the regular shopping that you do. It doesn't increase the prices to you, it just gives us a cut. Um, so thank you, Amazon, for that. So I've got Alfonso here, and you've got a skull inside your head. And we're gonna use these skulls to help you learn a little bit about the form and the function of the different shapes, and then see how we do with identifying some of the, um, of the creatures that we've got behind me. So, what I always like to point out on a skull first, and one of the first things that I notice when somebody hands me a mystery skull, is I look at the eyes. So, you can take your finger gently and feel the outer edges of the skull. I'm not talking about the squishy part of your skull. Don't mess with that, that hurts when you poke it. But the hard part of your skull, it's just underneath your skin. And some of the thinnest skin that you have is on your face because there's not a ton of um, typically fat or 
muscles inside your face. We have just the teeniest little skin under there. So you can feel the outer section of your orbital or your eye socket, which is really, really great. The eye socket is awesome. Oh, thank you, Mike, for donating. We love those donations. Um, that's really, really great. Um, if you want to donate any time to our organization, you can do that through the link right there at the bottom of your screen, or you can do that on our website, harborwildwatch.org. So thank you, Uncle Mike. So we've got our skull here, Alfonso, the eyes. Now the eyes on this skull, and then a lot of the skulls that I have behind me are forward facing. So we say eyes in front likes to hunt. That's an animal that needs to look forward and is less concerned about something sneaking up on it from behind and is more focused on capturing something in the front. Now, eyes in the front aren't always indicative of a carnivore though. They can, they can also be um, an adaptation for an animal that needs stereoscopic vision. Oh, Karen, thank you for donating. Woohoo! Look at those donations coming through. We just love that support that you guys are able to give us. Um, we really, really appreciate that. So we've got our forward facing eyes, but they're also really handy if you need to swing through um, and have depth perception. So animals like monkeys and primates also have stereoscopic vision because they need to have um, the ability to see things and navigate in a 3D space. And a really cool trick that you can do to test this out, and you can do this with anything in your house, but I like to do it with a person, is to close one eye and block somebody's face. So right now I'm blocking my own face on the screen. And then switch eyes. And it looks like your thumb moved or the person moved, but it didn't. Each eyeball sees just a slightly different view and that helps to overlap and, and give some context to your brain, which can interpret those things, which is really, really important for us. So we've got stereoscopic vision. Eyes in front likes to hunt. Eyes on the side likes to hide. So here's a one front facing predator type animal. Let me pull out another one. Uh, let's see this one. All right, so this is definitely a predator species. Really huge eyes, forward facing. The size of the eyes can also give you a clue to the, uh, the habitat or the, the lifestyle habits of the animal. I can tell that this is a nocturnal animal because these are really, really big eyes. And big eyes are great for hunting at night. Here's a similarly sized predator that has smaller eyes. So you can see really forward facing eyes on both of them, but this guy's are really, really small. So any guesses to maybe which skulls I'm holding up here? They're both carnivores, both forward facing eyes. This one's active during the day. This one's active at night. And if you said uh, a big cat for this one, you're totally correct. This is a uh, jaguar or a leopard. Um, it's hard for me to tell the, the distinctions between them. Um, and then this is a bear skull. So bear skulls have very small eyes. Um, we'll talk about some of the other, other features as well. Now let me show a good example of a prey species. What I mean when I say eyes on the side. So this is an animal, a common domesticated animal um, with really, really big eyes. Um, and this is an animal that has a bit of a uh, reinforcement to their skull because this is an animal that likes to ram. There's your clue for what animal this is. <laughs> it's also an herbivore, um, which we can tell by the teeth. I'll focus on teeth here in a moment, but this is a sheep. So we've got our little sheep friend here, uh, which is really, really cool to see. Okay, so we've talked eyes. Let's talk nose for a second. And you can use your own nose. Don't pick it, of course, gross. Um, but you can feel the soft part of your nose, this wiggly part. Mine's a little bit crooked. Thanks for that genetics. But this wiggly, wiggly, wiggly part is made of cartilage. Your ears are made out of the same materials. You can kind of fold and they spring right back to the same shape. Very useful and um, very important material, but not a part of the bone. So we're gonna focus on the bone. So feel your nose, feel the squishy part, and then feel up until you get to that hard part. That's your nasal bone right there. Um, so if I bring Alfonso back, you can see Alfonso's nose doesn't stick out very far. 
it's maybe an inch total depth, not huge. And that's one adaptation that we have um, as humans is we don't have a super well developed sense of smell compared to some other animals because we don't really communicate by smell. Now, smell is important to us. It helps us to survive and your nose is very well adapted to smelling a couple of things that help with your survival. The first, smelling fire is really good. How many of you have ever been driving in the car and you're like, somebody's barbecuing? Or you smell maybe burning plastic in your house and that's like a panic moment for you. That is a smell that's evolved to keep humans alive, both for survival, like you're out in the woods and you need to find warmth and find fire, or if you need to avoid fire because it might be you know, your house is on fire. So smelling fire is one thing that we smell really well. The other thing that we smell really well is rotten stuff. You ever had something dead and you smelled it before you saw it? That's an adaptation for us humans to be able to know basically that, ooh, that's rotten, that's past its prime, don't eat that. Nowadays we can read and we put ex expiration dates on our food, but before that, people just did the plain old sniff test and if it smelled rotten, we didn't eat it. Um, likewise, humans have a very strong aversion to very, very stinky smells, right? If you smell something so gross, it makes us kind of gag and throw up. That's an adaptation to help you not eat whatever disgusting thing that you just found. So not a great sense of smell, like I can't track down uh, who was in this house last with my nose and we don't communicate by smell, thank goodness, otherwise people would be like peeing all around the edges of their property every day, yuck. Um, but, oh yeah, <laughs> somebody said dead rat in the crawl space. Yeah, that'll uh, get your attention. Mold is another one, just definitely don't sniff close to mold, ugh, gross. You guys are grossing me out just thinking about it. Uh, <laughs> I'm imagining there's lots of vomit emojis in the comments. Um, if we compare our sense of smell to an animal that has a much larger, a much larger nose, so this is our bear once again. Um, the bear's nose is very, very strong, um, and they do communicate by smell. So they can go to the bathroom, they can mark their territory, they can smell where prey have been, so they're sniffing out the deer poop that might be nearby to help um, them navigate to their next meal. Uh, which is really important. There's another critter back here that's got a really strong uh, nose right here. And our own Stina Troyer once um, was studying these animals in Alaska um, and their sight is not great, but their smell is amazing. And they are um, really a, like in tune with what normal smells are. So when they smell a human, if you get kind of upwind of one of these critters, they will disappear. Um, and this is the sea otter. We'll talk about sea otters when we get to teeth. Well, let's do it now. Let's talk about teeth because teeth are really important to identifying a skull. So if we go to back to Alfonso, we've got some teeth here and we have a lot of teeth. Um, we've got basically three different kinds of teeth. Um, and I always tell my kids when they're brushing their teeth that they don't have to brush all their teeth, just the ones they want to keep, which is all their teeth. Yeah, you brush all your teeth. Um, we have incisors in the front. So the incisors are the kind of chiseled teeth in the front. You can picture eating, chomping into an apple. Um, and Alfonso's got a couple of missing teeth. Um, he didn't brush his teeth. So we've got incisors, those are, imagine eating an apple, those are the kind of the chipping teeth. Then we have canine teeth on the side, and I love to look at canine teeth on young kids, kids who've just gotten their adult teeth in. Um, so the tooth fairy's taken away their baby teeth, and there's those big ones left behind, because they're often much sharper than they are in, say like me. I'm kind of old and my canines are worn down. Um, but canines are the meat-eating teeth, um, so you can imagine if you're gonna bite into a piece of beef jerky and you're gonna kind of tear it, um, that's that emotion and you'd use those canine teeth on the sides. And then we have molars in the back. So the molars um, at the back are the grinding teeth, the crushing, crunching teeth that helps us to get the nutrients out of our food. So you, you chew your food in order to extract the nutrients and then swallow it and then your stomach does the rest. If you compare our skulls to like birds, birds don't have teeth and birds don't chew their food. So they actually eat rocks um, and they keep them in their gizzard, um, which grinds up their food internally. 
Um, I'm kind of glad that we have teeth, although I do have to brush them every day, twice a day, which is kind of crazy. Uh, so that's our human skull. Let's compare it to some of our, our other skulls here. So we've got um, the big cat skull here, um, and the big cat has big canine teeth. You can see here, these are the, the capturing teeth. If this is a, a jaguar, a leopard, they're gonna pounce and grab um, their prey using those big, huge teeth. And then in the back, these right here are called carnassial teeth, um, and they work like scissors. And this looks really similar to kind of your dog's teeth in the back. Your dog has carnassial teeth as well. Um, and they line up like scissors, and they can only use one side of their jaw at a time. And you've seen this if you've ever watched your dog um, chew a bone. They don't just straight chomp on them. They tilt their head to the side and really line up, and they move their jaw over. So your jaw moves quite a bit. So um, let's go back to Alfonso, and we can look a little bit at that jaw. The jaw is not attached in these animals um, after they're dead. Your jaw is held in place by a bunch of ligaments and muscles, and you can feel those if you clench your teeth. You can see the muscle moving there. And then it'll go up and attach underneath your cheekbone. So if you clench your teeth and you're touching your cheekbone, nothing happens. And then it attaches up here. You can see that moving again. Um, and that is the path going here from the jaw, the sides of it up through the cheekbone and attaching to your temple kind of right there. All right, let's show off some herbivore teeth while we can. Got my sheep back out here again. Um, and my sheep is got springy jaws. <laughs> Sorry if that sounds distracting to you. Uh, but it's wired so that it can show the movement and keeps the jaw within um, and paired up with the cranium. So these right here are what we call um, veg veg herbivore teeth. These are vegetation chompers for sure. Um, and teeth are interesting, interesting because they only have bottom incisors. They don't have top incisors. They match their uh, lower teeth up to their gums. Um, and llamas do this and sheep do this. Uh, goats as well. Kind of neat. And these teeth will continue growing throughout the animal's life. Um, and as they're um, chewing and chewing and chewing and chewing, they're trying to extract the nutrients out of the plant cells. And plant cells have a wall around them, so they're a lot tougher, a lot more fiber uh, for these animals. So they really have to grind and grind and grind and grind and grind. And then we've got some specialist animals that have teeth that are really particularly well evolved. Um, anybody think they can guess this skull by the teeth? These are teeth that are enforced with iron um, incorporated into them, which is what gives them that really strong color. Nice. Um, and this is an animal that can do amazing things with their teeth. Uh, this is a beaver. So good job if you guessed beaver. And beavers are able to straight up chew through trees. If I tried to do that with my teeth, there's no way. They would, they would wear down, they would um, break and fall off. Um, but the beaver's teeth, especially their incisors, continue to grow throughout their entire lifetime. Um, and they chomp and chew um, trees. Really, really cool. They also have kind of a reinforced back of the skull so that they can then drag those logs around. Really, really cool creature and oh, just one of the cutest little things you've ever seen. Aren't they adorable? Oh, show me some beaver love. Okay, let's see another specialist toothed animal. This is a weird one. We don't have these here um, in Washington. We have their relatives. This is a crab eater seal. And I didn't expect anybody would guess that, but take a look at those teeth. Um, and this is a replica, so this is a plastic model. And I know it's plastic because the nasal cavity is filled in. Um, the teeth are made out of the same material as the skull, although some color has been added, so you can kind of see that. Um, it's a pretty decent uh, replica here. They've even got the wear marks on the teeth to make it look more authentic. Um, but crab eater seals eat krill and crab larvae, and so they're able to kind of use these almost like strainers. So they take a big bite through the water and then squish um, that material out of their um, out of their mouth, the water out, so they can then swallow the krill that's left behind. And then let me pull out one of my bigger skulls here. 
This is another replica. This is the bottlenose dolphin. Um, and bottlenose dolphin have fish catching teeth. And they've got a lot of them. Um, this jaw is wired shut because they, they have very fragile jaws, so I don't want to break it. Um, but you can see rows and just tons and tons and tons of these little sharp curved pointy teeth. That is perfect for catching fish. Um, so fish are really slippery. They, they don't exactly want to be caught and eaten. Um, and so dolphins have these really great fish catching teeth. Our resident orcas, which I wish I had an orca skull, but they're huge. They're about um, five or six feet long. Uh, they have very similar teeth as well. And our, our orcas here, the resident uh, orcas, they eat salmon as their main food. Now, this fish eating teeth idea is carried on in other fish eaters that we've got. This one's a um, California sea lion. Um, and this is a very old, old specimen. This um, skull we've got from Noah many years ago, and it was super old when we got it, but many uh, similarly shaped teeth all the way along. And then a really cool fish, ooh, this one's so heavy. Um, a really cool fish eater is the alligator skull. Now, I have to be really careful with this skull because um, this one nearly gave me stitches. Uh, these teeth are incredibly sharp, so I'll see if I can get a little closer for you to see. Um, so this is a real skull and the teeth are real and they're very sharp, but rows and rows of teeth that are all the same is perfect for capturing fish, which is what alligators eat. Pretty cool, huh? Um, oh, this is such a heavy skull. Really cool texture on this. A lot of people think the texture of the alligators comes really from their um, their scales, but it's a combination of the scales and the skull together. All right. Is that enough about teeth? Should we talk about something else? We got a lot of skulls I can talk about. Um, let's talk about jaws. Um, I mentioned before that you can move your jaw around because it's not attached, um, which always kind of cracks me up when somebody says bite down on something. Well, you can really only bite up because you can only move your lower jaw. But um, let's talk jaw strength with some of the strongest jaws uh, that we have here. Anybody want to guess what this skull is? It, it's not native to here in Washington. This is from, um, from Africa. This is a gorilla skull. So good job if you said uh, gorilla here. And when you look at a gorilla's face, you can really see, wow, yeah, look, that's totally a gorilla. And what's amazing about gorillas is the strength of their bite. So they have all the same teeth that we do, incisors in the front, canine teeth, and theirs are very, very large uh, because they do territory displays with their teeth. They kind of really bare their teeth and um, scare uh, intruders away. And then the grinding teeth at the back for eating things like bamboo. And then they have this huge jaw. So this, this section right here, um, the side of the jaw is really enlarged and big. The joint where the jaw sits is really, really huge. And then the space underneath that comes all the way up to the top. And gorillas have this like pocket for jaw muscle attachment. So if you feel the top of your head, it's pretty smooth. There's no crest of bone running along the top of it. They just have, um, it's really, really smooth all over. Here's, for comparison, our Alfonso skull. So really smooth and really large, bulbous almost, I mean, you compare the two. Um, human beings' bite strength is not that strong, but gorillas have an amazing ability um, to really bite down hard. So this is all filled with jaw muscle. So when a gorilla chews, if you look at the top of their head, the whole thing moves, um, kind of similar to your temple moves when you chew. Really, really strong bite strength um, on our gorilla. Here's another primate. This one doesn't have nearly the bite strength. This is from a blue monkey. Um, you can see the similarities and why these are all primates. Forward facing eyes, kind of a flattened nose, not, not a whole lot of snout on these animals and really similar teeth. And then a huge brain case, pretty smart little creatures. Um, but no ridge here and 
not a very large section there um, to be able to wrap up. So this little monkey does not have nearly the jaw strength of this guy, even if you were to supersize the skull up to be gorilla size, it's still not nearly as powerful as this one. And then probably our most um, strongest biting animal, um, I forgot where I put it, um, that we do have here in Washington would be on our sea otter. So this sea otter has this crest running along it. Um, it also has um, a good amount of jaw attachment and that's because sea otters eat really hard food, super, super hard. So they're eating things that have um, like a tough shell, like our crab friends that we saw earlier, they are eating things like um, urchins with their tough spines all over them, clams um, that then they can uh, crack open. And I wanna just show you the molars. This is a real sea otter skull on loan from Noah. This is the one I really have to have a lot of um, paperwork for. And look how big these molars are. I mean, that's easily nearly twice the size of my molars in the back of my head. Um, and nice pearly bright white. Maybe this one brushed their teeth. Just kidding. But uh, this is an animal that has a really big brain. So the brain case is really large here. And the brain case um, can kind of give you a clue to the intelligence of the animal. Are they a problem-solving animal? Are they more instinctual? Um, but not always. So. Big, bigger brains or maybe taking up more of the skull um, than the face takes up is a good indicator that it's a, it's a pretty smart animal. And this is one of the few tool users in the animal group. So sea otters use tools. They will um, grab a rock or um, something hard that they can smash and they use it like an anvil. And so they're, they'll smash, smash, smash um, in order to break open and, and get their food that they need. They're small creatures, so they, um, they lose a lot of heat in their um, aquatic environment. They're in pretty cold water. And so they eat about 40% of their body weight a day. Um, and they weigh, you know, 100 pounds or more. So that's um, a significant amount of food. Um, that's like you trying to eat, gosh, a, a dog food bag full of uh, 40, 50 pounds of food a day. Goodness, that's a lot. Um, and they're able to do that with these really, really cool teeth. Okay, so we've talked about eyes a little bit. We've talked about noses and how big they are. Um, we've talked about teeth and the kinds of teeth. We've got jaws. Um, so we've got a lot going for us when we can look at a skull and figure out. Um, the last thing that I'm gonna point out to you is um, on the back side of the skull and humans have it really reduced. So you can kind of feel right behind your ears, there's kind of this lumpy section um, it doesn't move when you move your jaw, so it's not attached to your jaw, and it's kind of just right back here. That is um, a spot called auditory bula, and I'm going to show you on my cat skull because cats have really big auditory bulas. And this is uh, a chunk of bone that almost helps to grab sound and then um, feed it to the inner ear bones. So you have three tiny, tiny bones inside your ear um, that help to send vibrations from the air into your brain so that your brain can interpret it. So the sounds that I'm making make sense to you, which is really, really cool. Um, and in nocturnal animals, it makes sense that they would have really big auditory bullets so that they can hear. So I'm gonna actually, well, Hard to see on my giant skull. Let me show you on another uh, on another species here. Uh, in our bear, they're really convoluted and kind of spiky um, because they're not really out and about during the day. Let me see some of our other creatures who might have good auditory bula. Here's one. Um, now this is a species you might recognize. Um, this is a domesticated animal. You might have one at your home. Um, and the back here, these little lumpy, bumpy parts are the auditory bula of the dog. Um, I think this is a um, golden retriever, but I'm not positive. Um, really cool to see. And again, those carnassial teeth with the ability to slice through meat are here. Um, big canine teeth, actually named K9. 
canine after dogs. Um, and then little incisor teeth in the front. Good sense of smell, nice long. Um, and some of the, the dog breeds have been particularly bred. Things like bloodhounds and um, foxhounds, other scent hounds have been bred to have a really nice long nose like that to be able to capture smells, which is really, really cool. All right, so let me, um, I'm gonna take my care, my phone here out of our handy dandy holder. And what we'll do is flip this around and I'll just point out some of my, um, my other skulls that I have here. Cause I know that's what everybody's interested in. Um, if you give a shout out in the comments, you want to know more about an animal or a skull or where it came from. Um, we'll do our best to answer those either during our broadcast. We've got my whole team, Stina and Carly are helping out on the uh, tech side of things. Um, maintaining their social distance. I'm sure they're at home in their pajamas right now where I had to get dressed, but um, we'll just show off some of the, the creatures that we have here in our, um, in our display. So um, the, the big, we'll start with the big one because we've got a really, really big skull here. Uh, this is a gray whale skull. This is from a juvenile gray whale and gray whales get pretty big. They're about the size of a bus. Um, and so this is an animal um, that we we actually built this entire um, display case around this skull. And the only way that we could get it to fit in this um, and make any sort of sense where people could sort of see it um, is to put it in upside down and backwards. <laughs> so if this were um, the whale, the body of the whale would be coming out of this piece right here. Um, so this is the back half of the skull. And you can feel... Um, on the back of your skull where it joins your spine, that's that kind of knobby spot right there um, on our whale skull. Um, our other really big skulls that we have, we have a northern elephant seal skull. Um, and this one actually needs, needs a spot of glue here on the jaw bones. Um, you can see really, really big teeth here. Um, these are uh, fish eating animals, but they use their huge teeth to do battle. Ooh, to do battle. This is a male. Um, lots of glue needed on this guy. This one um, will actually use their huge teeth uh, to fight with other males over territory and females. Oh, this one is a really, really special and very kind of um, sought after skull. And <laughs> you guys, I don't know if I can convey to you how massive this thing is. Um, this is a huge walrus skull. Um, and it is the heaviest skull we have next to the whale skull. So this thing weighs a ton. Um, it is oh, so solid. I can't even lift it with one hand. That tells you how, how big it is. Um, all right, so then we've got things like uh, a bison. So again, with no upper teeth here and these incisors and then teeth along the sides that grow continuously to chew up um, their vegetation. In the nose, you can see all this lace in here. Those are the sinuses of this animal. Um, really good sense of smell in the bison. Um, and as a prey species, that's advantageous because it helps them to be able to avoid predators. They can smell where the cougars have been. Same thing in our, uh, in our cow skeleton. Same thing, lots and lots of nasal passages there. Again, more, more able to to see this. Oh, somebody says, where are the eye sockets on the walrus? Okay, so it's weird, but they are, a walrus eye would be right here, hanging out. They don't have a cheekbone that connects all the way up and around, or at least I don't have that on this skull here. Um, so the eye would be right there. And they have really large eyes um, for focusing underwater in darkness. Um, very good question, Sherry. Okay, so let's, I'm not very tall here, so I'm just gonna just um, check out some of my weird pig species. We've got uh, the Viverusa pig, which has like the funkiest uh, tusks um, imaginable. Here, I'll set this down. I've got a picture of a Viverusa right here. Now, I don't wanna say that's a face only a mother could love because I love all creatures, but whew, man. That's the, the Viberusa pig. Um, and then we've got a similar species in the peccary, like a wild pig. 
Um, and you can see the similarities when I show them side by side, just the shape of them. The teeth are similar. Really, really neat um, specimens that uh, these were donated by our friend Paul Kodzik, uh, retired dentist who took a traveling show uh, to schools when kids would ask to see about teeth. So really kind of neat. And then let's talk about some of our smallest skulls. Got some really tiny ones here. Got a vampire bat, which is so small, smaller than my thumbnail. Look at those tiny, tiny nostrils. And then we've got an iguana. So really big eyes on the iguana, which surprises a lot of people. Tiny plant eating teeth. These look like fish eating teeth, but iguanas are herbivores. And then I have a rattlesnake skull too. So you can see the teeth on this. The bottom jaws come separate. It needs another spot of glue. Those two pieces should be sticking together. Um, but that's a rattlesnake. Up top, we've got a zebra skull, um, which is really similar to horses skulls. They're closely related and a camel. And I can tell I need to dust up there. Nice. Uh, Sherry asks, what's the purpose of those, those, these big horns? These are for, um, for fighting. So the males typically grow these big tusks um, and they'll ram one another with that. I did not kill a vampire bat, no. I did not kill one. Um, I don't know if you can see just how sharp those little teeth are, but very, very sharp. Yeah, we um, had a poster hanging in this, um, this exhibit for years and we have a domesticated cat skull. Um, it's packed up right now. We use that in classroom teaching. And um, the photograph that we used in the poster was of Stina's cat, Khaleesi. Um, and somebody said, oh, you killed your cat to have its skull on display? And no, we didn't, we just used your photo. Um, this is a snapping turtle. So snapping turtle, really hard shell um, and almost beak-like in their uh, lower jaw. Some of my other small things, I've got a skunk, um, insect eater, very, very cool. Um, and I've got an armadillo skull, but this one is a little misleading because the armadillo skull plate right here, this is skin and is not a part of the actual skull. It's just been glued there so that people can kind of see um, the animal and another insect eater with those little tiny, tiny teeth. Um, and then we've come to kind of the weirdest and strangest and definitely the most rare thing that we have back there. That is a leg bone of a mastodon. Really, really cool animal, like similar to a woolly mammoth and they roamed our area um, before the ice age. So we had mastodons here big elephant-like creatures. You can tell a mastodon uh, apart from a mammoth um, in their fossils by their teeth. So uh, a mammoth tooth actually looks a lot like our bison teeth here. They're ridgy and wavy, whereas a mastodon tooth um, is got more uh, cupped uh, shape to it. I don't have a good example of a mastodon tooth. Anyone wants to donate a mastodon tooth to Harbor Wild Watch, that'd be a cool thing to have. Um, but they have more kind of cupped teeth uh, it actually means nipple tooth. The word mastodont, um, that's what that comes from. So yeah, thanks for tuning in with us with our super cool skull collection. Uh, I'm glad I was able to show off some of these things. Hopefully we'll be back open and ready for business soon and you can come in person to visit these things. Um, in the meantime, we will continue to offer these really cool educational experiences for you. Um, Again, if you've got questions, go ahead and throw those in the comments. We'd love to, to hear um, what you're learning, what you're wondering about. Um, and then, of course, if you want to donate to us, that'll help keep us um, in business and, and able to offer these fun, free programs for everyone. Um, we love your support, and you can do that right here through Facebook, or you can do it through our website as well. So thanks again for tuning in. Again, if you want to leave us a, a review on our on our Facebook page. We would love that. I'm going to come back to my little crabby friends in here. Um, they've been so well behaved. I assume I didn't hear any ruckus from the other room. Um, so I'm going to give these guys their lunch here. Um, and they're getting 
shrimp. Um, so you can watch and see. Everybody gets a little excited when the shrimp comes in the water. Even our herbivore kelp crab gets really, really excited um, when it's lunchtime. So with that, thanks for tuning in. We will make sure this is posted um, to our YouTube channel as well. So you can uh, share and forward and tell all your friends all the wonderful things you're learning about with Harbor Wild Watch. We really appreciate everybody tuning in. Thanks to my back end staff, Carly and Sina. Um, for making this go smoothly and answering all those questions as we go. We really appreciate that. Thanks so much.